Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where once again for another year, our New Year's resolution is about to be to learn more fascinating things. And so we figured, why wait? Let's hop to it and learn a little bit about some of the world's most fascinating animals, marsupials today, including but not limited to kangaroos. And we're excited that you joined us to be able to learn about these amazing animals. And we've got the perfect teacher to help you learn all the fascinating facts that you'll want to know and tell all of your friends over your winter break. We've got Ashlyn here live at Wonders of Wildlife in Missouri to take us through the marvelous world of marsupials. Now, one question we tend to get a lot with animal presentations are, are these animals social animals? I'll let Ashlyn tell you that, but one thing I know about this group is that we are, and so there's a chat box to the right of the screen. Please keep it interactive. Ashlyn's going to ask you some questions to find out what you know and want to know about these amazing animals. So you can answer in the chat box in the, uh, the poll tool over there. And if you have any questions whatsoever, and I know you will, please don't hesitate. Just ask those in the chat box. I'll be collecting all those in the last 10 minutes or so. I'll interview Ashlyn with your questions to get you as many answers as we can. So Without further ado, let's hop to it. Like we said, I'll introduce you to your teacher for today, Ashlyn and the team at Wonders of Wildlife. Hey guys, like Brian said, my name is Ashlyn and I am a lead educator over at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. I'm super excited to be here with you guys today and talk about some super amazing marsupials. Before we get started, I'm going to share a little bit of information about myself and where I work and what I do. So, one is a wildlife is an aquarium and wildlife museum located in Springfield, Missouri, and we have a huge variety of amazing wildlife at our facility. We have everything from sharks to penguins to alligators, bears, sea turtles, and then of course even a couple marsupials as well. So that's what we're gonna what we're gonna be learning about today. Um, I'm an educator over at Wonders of Wildlife, which means that my entire job is to teach people of all ages about our natural world and the wildlife that we can find in it. Right. So now that you guys know a little bit about me and about Winners Wildlife, I want to know a little bit about you guys. So I want you guys to get some practice using your chat box since you're going to need it um, later on during our lesson. So um, go ahead and pull up your chat boxes and I want you guys to tell me what your favorite animal is. So go ahead in your chat box, tell me what is your favorite animal. And I'm going to give you guys just a minute to go ahead and type that out. But while you're typing, I'll tell you my favorite animal. Um, my favorite animals are amphibians. So any frogs or toads or salamanders, those guys are my favorite. Now I'll wait for you guys. Go ahead and type that out. I'm starting to get a couple answers. Someone said monkeys. Monkeys are pretty cool. Spiders. I also like spiders quite a bit. Toucans. Fish, nice. Polar bears, tigers. Wow, yeah, you guys have some awesome favorites. So now that I know a little bit about you guys, um, let's go ahead and start learning about marsupials. You guys ready? Cool, all right, let's go. So the word marsupial may or may not uh, be a word that you've heard before. So we're gonna go ahead and figure out what it means if you don't know what it means. So a marsupial is a type of animal that raises its young in a pouch. So before we talk about why they do this or um, what the pouch looks like, let's go ahead and review what it means to be a mammal because mammals, or excuse me, marsupials are mammals, right? So there are five main characteristics that all mammals have. And of course, since marsupials are mammals, this means that they have all of these five characteristics as well. So if you know what one or some of those characteristics might be, Go ahead and tell me in your chat box, what are some characteristics or some features that all mammals have? And I'll give you guys just a second to type. There's gonna be a lot. So even if you can get just one, that would be great. Cool, all right. I'm starting to see some answers roll in, let's see. Okay, I see a couple of people saying that they have hair. Yep, some of us are saying they have backbones. I'm seeing some other answers. Yep. Yep, you guys are doing great. Okay, I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds. Go ahead and type out what are some characteristics of mammals. Cool. All right. We are going to go ahead and show you the five main characteristics of mammals. So we're going to review them really quickly, just that way we all know what they mean before we move on. Okay. So the first um, characteristic of mammals that we're going to talk about is that they are endothermic, 
which means that they're able to maintain their own body temperature, right? So this is something that reptiles and amphibians and fish aren't able to do. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but we humans are actually mammals. And what do we do when our body gets cold? I want you to think about it for a second. If you get really cold, what do you do? Maybe you shiver or you get goosebumps, kind of like the picture you're about to see on this slide. Um, so when our body gets cold, we might get goosebumps, right? There we go. There's a picture. Um, what about if we get hot? What do we do? Think about it for a second. If you go outside and you play for a really long time or it's just really hot outside, what do you do? You might sweat, right? Yeah. So these are things that our body does to help maintain our temperature, right? And all mammals have their own ways of doing this or maintaining their own body temperature. So the second feature that makes a mammal a mammal is that they are vertebrates, which means that they have backbones. So if you can, I want you to go ahead and reach around and touch your back. And hopefully you feel something back there. Maybe it's your backbone, right? So if you have a backbone, that means that you are a vertebrate, right? So that means that you are also a mammal because mammals have spines, right? All right. So the third thing that makes a mammal a mammal is that they have hair or fur on their bodies. So this hair can have a whole bunch of different uses, but most of the time it's used to help keep them warm. And then sometimes it's also used to help them communicate with other animals, right? So some mammals even might have whiskers um, on their face, which are specialized hairs that help them to feel their surroundings, which is pretty cool. Um, the fourth thing that makes a mammal a mammal is that they give birth to live young. So that means that they don't lay eggs like birds or reptiles, but instead, when they have babies or when they have young, the babies will grow and develop inside of the parent's body before they're born and before they start their journey in the outside world, okay? The fifth and final thing that makes an animal a mammal is that they will drink milk from their mother when they're young. So other animals like birds and reptiles and fish um, sometimes will be on their own when they're really small, um, right after they hatch, but mammals aren't really that way. So young mammals are going to rely on their parents for food and protection, and they're going to drink milk, right? Okay, so now that we know that marsupials are animals that have all of these characteristics, so they're mammals, right? And they also have a pouch. I want you guys to tell me what are some examples you can think of of marsupials. So if you know any examples of marsupials, go ahead and tell me in the chat box what some of those species might be or some examples of marsupials. I'll give you a hint. If you can't think of any, there might be a picture of one on the screen. There might be a picture of one on the screen. So go ahead and tell me in your chat box, what are some examples of marsupials? Let's see how many species you guys can think of. I'll give you just a couple minutes to type that out. A couple minutes to think about it. See, ooh, yep, I'm starting to see some answers. Okay, awesome. You guys are doing great. I'm seeing more answers. I think you guys all know what marsupials are already. Great job. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds. Yep, you guys have got it. Great job, yeah. You guys know quite a few species of marsupials. So here are some pictures of some marsupial species. Um, and we might talk a little bit about some of them today. Um, some of them we won't talk about, and that's totally fine. Um, but we might see some species on here that are kind of familiar and maybe some that we haven't seen before. And that's totally okay because there are over 200 species of marsupials out there, if you can believe it. That is a ton, right? And the interesting thing is that even though there are so many species of marsupials out there, they can only be found in a couple of places around the world. So this map here can show us where we can find um, marsupials across different areas of the world. And we can see that they can only really be found in three places, right? So the first place they can be found is here in the United States where I live. Um, and we can see by looking at the map key down at the bottom that there's only one species of marsupial that lives here in the United States. Pretty crazy, right? The next place we can see marsupials is in Central and South America. And we can see that they have a couple more species than uh, we do here in the United States, but not a ton more, right? Now, if we look over on the right side of the map, we can see the third place we can find marsupials, and that would be Australia and New Guinea, right? So by looking at the map key, we can see the amount of marsupials in this area is very, very concentrated. And this is where we can actually find two thirds of the world's marsupial species. Isn't that crazy? 
Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. So earlier on, I mentioned that marsupials have a pouch that they use to raise their young, right? So we're going to go ahead and talk about um, what these pouches look like and how they work. So the reason that marsupials have this pouch is because baby marsupials, which are called joeys, are born really, really early, way earlier than most mammals. So in fact, most joeys are smaller than the size of a jelly bean when they're born. I want you guys really quick, if you can, take your hand and try to show yourself or maybe a family member, if you're around somebody else, what the size of a jelly bean is. It's pretty tiny, right? Yeah. So that's really, really small. Um, and that is the size they are when they're born. And they're also born with no hair. And they're so small that there's no way for them to be independent or survive at all unless they're inside of um, their mom's pouch, right? So after they're born, they will live inside the mom's pouch. And that gives them the space that they need to grow big and strong. Um, besides keeping the joey safe, the pouch also keeps them warm because remember, they don't have any hair when they're born, so they need to be able to stay warm. And it also is um, where they're going to be able to drink milk from their mom until they're able to get big enough to eat the same food as the adults. So the pouch is made up of really, really stretchy skin and can hold joeys of a variety of sizes. So from the teeny, teeny, tiny little newborns that we just talked about all the way up into um, the joeys that are the size that you guys can see in this video. So this kangaroo joey that you're seeing is huge, right? So that pouch can hold a lot of different sizes of joeys, right? And you might be wondering, how do the mother marsupials hold such big joeys, right? That's a pretty big kangaroo that we see, right? So the secret is that the opening of the pouch has a muscle lining that helps keep the joeys inside. So um, when we talk about pouches, marsupial pouches, um, they actually work pretty, pretty similarly to a drawstring bag. So I have a drawstring bag with me here today. And this is gonna be our marsupial pouch, okay? And then what's gonna happen is, is we have our Joey. This is my Joey for today. He's gonna go in the pouch. He's gonna get in there nice and snug. And then this opening that you see around his head is gonna have a muscle that's able to contract and hold that baby in there so that way they don't fall out, which is pretty awesome, right? So that is how our marsupial pouches are going to work, which is pretty awesome. So um, the Joey's is able to climb on into the pouch and stay nice and safe in there while that muscle holds them in. Um, another really cool thing about that muscle is that when the joeys get too big for the pouch, the mother marsupials are actually able to close the pouch up and contract that muscle. So that way, whenever the babies are too big, they don't try to climb back in there, right? because he can't get in there because that muscle is all contracted. So that will then teach the babies that they um, are now ready to be independent and they are able to um, start eating other things besides the milk, right? Which is pretty awesome. So that is how the pouches work. So now that we know a little bit more about the basics of the pouch and kind of how um, marsupial pouches work, we're gonna look at some different species. So if you guys are ready, we'll go ahead and pull up our first species. So the first species we're gonna look at is kangaroos. So kangaroos are the most famous of all marsupials and they are typically the animal that we think of when we hear the word marsupial, right? So this makes complete sense because kangaroos are actually the largest species of marsupial in the entire world. Pretty crazy, huh? So before I tell you anything else about kangaroos, I want to test your knowledge. And I want to see what you guys already know about kangaroos, okay? So I have a question for you. And that question is, where do kangaroos live? So I'm going to give you just a second. Go ahead and tell me in your chat box, where in the world can we find kangaroos? If you're having a hard time thinking about where kangaroos live, I want you to remember the map that we looked at earlier. And remember that there were those three areas in the world that we can find marsupials. So they have to live in one of those three areas, right? I'll give you guys just a minute to go ahead and type that out. We'll see what you come up with. I bet you guys are already experts on kangaroos, so we'll see. Yep, it looks like a couple of us are starting to get it. Yep, you guys are doing great. I see a lot of people who are giving me the right answer. Great job. A couple more seconds. Nice. Yeah, good job, guys. Yeah. So kangaroos are native to Australia. There's actually four species of kangaroo that we're going to be looking at today. Um, and here are some pictures of each species. So these four species are the red kangaroo, 
the eastern gray kangaroo, the western gray kangaroo, and the antelopine kangaroo. So these four species of kangaroo can be found all over the continent of Australia. And even though they look pretty similar, there are some pretty big differences between these four species. So red kangaroos are the largest species of kangaroo. Um, some of them can weigh over 200 pounds and they can reach heights above six feet. That is crazy. That is a really, really big animal, right? So they typically prefer to live in um, flat, dry environments like grasslands and deserts. And their red fur that kind of has that rusty color allows them to blend in with that landscape pretty well. So eastern and western gray kangaroos are a little bit different from our red kangaroo friends. Um, they're slightly smaller and they prefer more of a grassland habitat with a little bit more vegetation and then maybe some trees too. So we really don't find them out in the desert like we would the red kangaroos. Um, and just like we can gather from their name, they're obviously not as red colored as a red kangaroo. Um, they're more of like a dusty gray color. Um, the fourth species of kangaroo is the antelopine kangaroo. And these guys are quite a bit smaller than the other kangaroo species. And they prefer their habitat to be a little bit more humid um, than other kangaroo species as well. So they also really like forested areas. Um, they will definitely not be found in a desert area, probably not so much in a grassland, um, more in a forested area. That's kind of where they like to stay. Um, and they like a lot of vegetation where they live. So uh, the reason that vegetation is so important to kangaroos is because they are herbivores. So all four species you see here are herbivores, which means they eat only plants, right? So some of their favorite foods are gonna be grass and leaves, flowers, fruits, things like that. Um, kangaroos have a pretty interesting stomach too. So their stomach um, is actually chambered, kind of like a cow's stomach. So in order for them to properly digest all their food, they have to regurgitate what they've already eaten and they have to chew it a little bit more before they can swallow it again and then fully digest it. So I don't know about you guys, but I would not like if I had to eat my food that way. Would you guys like it? Probably not, right? It's kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> um, overall, um, kangaroos have some pretty cool adaptations that they can use to help them survive um, out in the wild. Um, and that is across the board, all four species that we see. Um, so one of the most famous adaptations that kangaroos have is their ability to jump. So kangaroos are not able to walk at all. They have to hop in order to get anywhere. And that's because their back legs are huge and they're really, really powerful and muscular. And they're actually kind of shaped like the letter Z. Um, and that allows them to bounce like a spring. So um, I have a question for you guys. So I want you to tell me in your chat box, how far do you think a kangaroo can jump? So tell me in your chat box, how far do you think a kangaroo can jump? And I'm going to give you guys a second to type. Maybe think about it for a second. How far do you think they can jump in one jump? Kind of a tricky question. Okay, I'm starting to see a couple people answer. See 10 feet. It's a great guess. 12 feet, 15 feet. You guys are kind of on the right track. Okay, I see someone saying 100 feet. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. We'll see if you're right. <laughs> Good job. So believe it or not, kangaroos can jump up to 30 feet in one jump. That is crazy, right? So I'm sure you can imagine how much ground they can cover. Um, but just in case it's a little hard for you to think about, uh, there is a video that you can see right now of some kangaroos jumping, and you can see how quick they can go, which is insane, right? So they're going pretty fast. <laughs> um, along with their ability to jump, kangaroos also have pretty big tails. So these guys will use their tails to help them balance themselves as they jump around. And even as they're sitting still, um, since most of the time they're going to be on those back two legs, right? Um, kangaroos are also really, really important to not only the ecosystems they live in in Australia, but also the culture as well. So kangaroos have been important symbols for the indigenous peoples of Australia for a really, really long time. And now they're even featured on the Australian coat of arms as a symbol of progress and moving forward because kangaroos can't move backwards either. So they can't walk, but they also can't hop backwards, which is pretty cool. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the second marsupial species we're going to talk about today. And that is the wombat. So before I get started with any details about wombats, I have a question for you guys. You ready? I have a lot of questions for you today. Okay, so where do you think wombats are native to? 
where do wombats live in the world? Go ahead and tell me in your chat box, where can we find wombats in the world? I'll give you guys just a second to type. And remember, if you're having trouble thinking about where wombats might live, I want you to think about that map we saw earlier and remember that there's three places where they might be able to live in the world. So you gotta pick one. We'll see what you got. Yep, a lot of us are starting to get it right. Good job. Yep, I see a lot of right answers. Great job, guys, yeah. So wombats live in Australia, just like kangaroos do. Um, there's three species of wombat in the world. And the most common of those three are going to be the bare-nosed or the common wombat. Um, and then after that, we have the near-threatened uh, southern hairy-nosed wombat. And then after that, we have the northern hairy-nosed wombat, which is one of the rarest mammals in the entire world because it's critically endangered. Um, and that is what makes it so rare, which is kind of crazy. So wombats are nocturnal, which means that they are awake at night, right? And they spend a lot of their time foraging for different grasses and roots and shrubs. And they rely um, on their sense of smell to find food because they really don't have that good of eyesight. So wombats are really, really good at digging and they're gonna use the claws that they have on their front feet to help them dig burrows. Um, and those burrows are where they're going to stay safe from predators. And they're also going to take a nap um, or sleep in those burrows as well, too. So speaking of sleep, did you guys know that wombats spend the majority of their time sleeping? So they can spend about 16 hours a day sleeping, which is pretty crazy, right? It's a lot of time to sleep. Do you guys sleep that long? I don't sleep that long. That'd be pretty nice, though, huh? <laughs> so a really cool adaptation that these guys have. Um, is that their pouch is actually facing backwards. So that's because um, they dig so much, they don't want any of the dirt or mud or anything that they're digging with their claws um, while they're digging their burrow to get into their pouch and harm their joeys. So that's why their pouch is backwards, which is pretty cool. Um, one more crazy fact about wombats is that they kind of have weird poop. I know that sounds a little weird, but a wombat scat is actually shaped like a cube, like an ice cube. Um, and that's because their digestion process takes a really, really long time. And their digestive tract will actually absorb a lot of the water as it is moving along. So by the time they end up going to the restroom, it's really, really dry and it's actually shaped like a cube. So now that you guys know a little bit more about wombats, we're gonna go ahead and move on and take a look at our next marsupial. You guys ready? Cool, all right. So the next marsupial we are going to take a look at are sugar gliders. I don't know about you guys, but I think they look really, really cool. They have those really big eyes and they're really colorful stripes on their bodies. Um, and just like our wombat friends, again, these guys can be found in Australia. Who would have guessed, right? <laughs> so instead of living mostly underground like our wombats do, they live way up in the trees, which is a little bit different. So um, these guys are, are called sugar gliders for a pretty big reason. And if you think you know why, I want you to go ahead and tell me in your chat box, why do you think they're called sugar gliders? Where do they get that name from? Where do sugar gliders get their name from? I'll give you guys just a minute to go ahead and type that out for me. Why are sugar gliders called sugar gliders? Let's see. Some of you guys are pretty quick typers. Good job. Yeah. I see a lot of right answers. Good job, guys. Yeah. Give you guys just a little bit more time. Yep, looking good. Okay, you guys are ready. We're gonna go ahead and reveal the answer. So these guys are omnivores, um, which means they eat plants and then also other animals like bugs and things. But their favorite fruits, favorite fruits, favorite foods are going to be fruit and other sugary things like nectar and tree sap. Um, which is where the sugar portion of their name comes from. And then the glider portion of their name comes from their ability to glide through the air using the skin flaps that are on either side of their body. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that their legs are fully stretched out and they have those flaps of skin on either side of their body that allow them to glide um, or to fly from tree to tree pretty smoothly um, and effortlessly. So these guys actually can't fly, um, which is why we call them sugar gliders. But they can fly pretty well from tree to tree, which is pretty awesome. Um, they're gonna use their tail that you can see there. It's kind of long and fluffy, and that helps them to steer themselves um, side to side while they fly, and then also to land too. Um, their tail 
um, can also help them when they're building their nests too, because they can use it to grab onto leaves and sticks and other things that they're going to use to build their nest. And they will um, be able to haul it back to where they're building. And then they can just use their tail that way too, which is pretty cool. So um, they spend a lot of time in their nests actually too. So those nests are really important to them um, because they that's where they sleep um, and that is where their safe space is. And they also are pretty social. So they're gonna spend a lot of time um, with other sugar gliders that are in their colony too. So the next marsupial we're gonna look at, my favorite marsupial, is the Virginia opossum. You guys saw my um, Joey earlier. This is a Virginia opossum pretty cool. So um, if you guys are ready for the next question, go ahead and tell me in your chat box, where do you think we can find Virginia opossums? So where in the world can we find Virginia opossums? So I'm going to say it again. Remember the map we looked at earlier and think about where these guys might live and then go ahead and tell me in your chat box where you think they might live. Okay. I'm excited to see your answers. Let's see what you got. See some people saying Australia. Okay. See some people saying South America, North America, the United States. Yep. Seeing great answers here. Okay. I'll give you just a couple more seconds. Go ahead and finish out what you're typing. Looking good, guys. Okay. So Virginia opossums live in North America. Um, specifically the United States and then kind of down into Central and South America as well. But they're actually the only marsupials that we have here in the United States, which makes them really, really special. So despite their name, they are not only found in Virginia. Um, that's actually kind of how they got their name, though, is that um, when English, settl English settlers who originally um, were colonizing in the state of Virginia. They actually saw them, and that's why they named them the Virginia opossum, because they were originally seen in Virginia, which is pretty cool. So um, they have a pretty wide range. Like I said earlier, they can be found here in the U.S., um, even down into Central America as well. Um, they're really, really good climbers, and they're going to use their tail. Um, so it's called a prehensile tail because it's able to grab onto things, and they will use that tail to help them grab onto tree branches and limbs, and then also balance themselves while they climb, too. So although they spend quite a bit of time in trees, they will usually spend the majority of their time down on the ground. Um, and they're also what we call opportunistic eaters. So that means that they will pretty much eat anything that they can find that looks like it'll be good for dinner, right? So they will, anytime they see the opportunity to eat something, they're going to eat it, right? So some of their favorite foods are going to be things like fruit and berries and eggs. Um, sometimes they'll even eat things like small birds um, and then reptiles and frogs and things like that, too. So um, they also really like insects and then other small invertebrates, too, um, like spiders and things. So um, Virginia opossums are known for um, their tick eating skills. So if you guys have ever been outside, especially here um, in Missouri, where I live, we have a lot of ticks in the summertime. So these guys are really, really awesome to have around, um, especially here where I live, because they eat a lot of those ticks and they help keep those populations of those ticks down. Um, and that can have a really, really big impact on the ecosystems that they live in. And then also um, on us as humans as well. So I really appreciate having them around. And I hope you guys do too, because they serve a really, really big purpose. Um, and their ability to eat such a wide range of foods can be um, partially attributed to the fact that they have a lot of teeth. So I actually have a skull with me from an opossum. I'm going to show it to you guys in just a second. But while I show it to you, I want you guys to tell me how many teeth you think opossums have. Okay. So tell me in your chat box how many teeth you think opossums have. I'm going to see if I can get it where you guys can see. I know it's a little hard to see from here. There's quite a bit of teeth in there. Quite a few. So go ahead and tell me in your chat box how many teeth you think an opossum has. I'm going to show it to you for a couple more seconds, and then I'm going to see what you guys have to say. Okay, all right. Pretty sharp teeth in there, too. All right, let's see. I'm seeing 30 teeth. Okay, 10 teeth. All right. A thousand teeth? Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Yeah, 
So these guys actually have about 50 teeth, which shockingly is the most teeth of any mammal here in North America. So they have more teeth than bears. They have more teeth than wolves, than coyotes, than bobcats, mountain lions. They have more teeth than all of them, which is crazy, right? So like I said earlier, they are opportunistic eaters, which means they'll eat just about anything they can find. So their teeth are pretty useful for that, but they're also really useful as a defense against predators. So when they're threatened, opossums will open their mouth and show off their pearly white teeth, and they might also hiss too. So we can see in the picture here on the left, we have a not so happy opossum. He's trying to maybe scare off some predators. Um, and then if that method doesn't work, they also have another method that they use to help scare off predators, and that is to play dead, which is pretty crazy. So they're going to, when they do this, uh, collapse to the ground. They're going to open their mouth, and then they're also going to secrete a really, really nasty smelling odor from their body that smells really similar to like a decaying animal, which is really, really gross. So I don't know about you, but if I was a predator and I saw that, I probably wouldn't want to eat it because it probably wouldn't taste very good, right? Yeah. So that's the possum's hope is hoping that those predators will be driven away by that nasty smell. Um, and then the opossum will be able to continue on its merry way, which is pretty cool. Um, just like all other marsupials that we looked at, these guys have pouches. So their joeys will live in the pouch for about two months. And then after those two months, they're going to do something pretty cool. So they're actually going to hitch a ride on mom's back. So you can see in the picture here, um, they are all hanging on to mom and then mom's going to walk around and go find food, go find shelter, whatever she needs to do. And the babies will just kind of hang on to her back. Um, I know it looks kind of cute, which is <laughs> to me, it looks pretty cute, but these guys can have anywhere from six to nine joeys per litter. So six to nine babies at a time, which means that once they're bigger, remember mom has to carry them all on her back, right? So mom has to be super, super strong to be able to carry all of those babies, which is really awesome. Um, the next marsupial we're going to take a look at. So if we're ready, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one are these guys. So they're really cool. I'm not going to tell you what they're called because I want you guys to go ahead and tell me in your chat box what you think these guys are called. So what type of marsupial do you think this is? If you don't know, that's totally fine. I want you to take your best guess. What do you think they're called? They have a pretty interesting name. Yep, you guys are doing great. I see someone, they said armadillo. Nice. I see someone said an anteater. They do kind of look like anteaters, you're right. Yep. I'm gonna give you guys a couple more seconds and then I'll tell you what their name actually is. It's kind of hard, it's tricky. All right. If you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what their name is. I didn't see a whole lot of people that got it right, but that is totally fine because these guys are not super common animals that we see every day. Um, these guys are called numbats or numbats. They kind of can be pronounced different ways. Um, and although they're native to only certain portions of Australia, they're super duper important and they actually serve as the animal emblem for Western Australia, which is really awesome. Um, they're not really closely related to anteaters, but sometimes they're called banded anteaters. Um, and that's because they have really, really similar diets to anteaters. So these guys are insectivores, which means that they eat mostly grubs and worms and ants and termites, um, things like that. And since most of those insects are only active during the day, so are the numbats or the numbats, which makes them pretty different from most other marsupials um, because most other marsupials are actually nocturnal. So in order for them to reach those insects, insects um, they have really, really long sticky tongues that they're going to use to reach into logs and small holes in the ground, um, just like an eater would. And unlike... Um, most other marsupials also, they have really, really unique pouches. So their pouch is actually not even a pouch at all. So I know I said that marsupials all have pouches. Um, they all do kind of have a pouch, but some of them will look a little bit different than others. So these guys actually have kind of like a skin fold um, on their stomach that they're going to use to cover the joeys. So it's not quite like a pouch, like a kangaroo. Um, that they can climb in, but it's actually a skin fold that will help cover those joeys and protect them. Um, and then once the joeys are about nine months old, 
they're going to um, come out and they're going to kind of be a little more independent. And then they're going to be able to eat those termites and those other insects that the adults are eating too, which is pretty cool. All right. I have one more marsupial for you guys to see today. And don't worry, I have saved the weirdest one for last. Okay. So if you're ready, we are going to go ahead and take a look at the marsupial mole, which is one of the most secretive marsupials in the entire world, which is crazy. So we really don't know that much about these guys um, because they spend so much of their time underground. So again, we can find these guys in Australia, just like a lot of our other marsupial friends. Um, and they have a lot of really, really special adaptations that help them to survive um, in the deserts that they live, right? So one of the most noticeable th um, adaptations that they have is the really big hard plate that they have on their nose. So you guys can see in these pictures here, they have this really big, um, it looks like skin area on their nose. It's actually a really hard plate that they use. Um, and then they also have some claws too. We can kind of see those as well. And both of those adaptations are used to help them dig and tunnel their way through the sand. So just like wombats, they also have a backwards pouch because remember, they're going to do a lot of digging. So that backwards pouch helps to make sure that those joeys don't get covered with sand um, while they dig, which is really important to make sure that they stay safe. Um, marsupial moles are also typically going to be insectivores, but they are pretty opportunistic. So as we can see in this picture, this one is eating a lizard, which is kind of crazy, but they do eat insects most of the time. Um, some of their foods that are going to be their favorites, like I said, are going to be ants and beetles. Um, and then of course the lizard we saw. Um, they don't have any ears, if you can believe that. So these guys don't have any ears at all, which is kind of crazy. And um, this is so that way they don't get clogged with dirt or sand while they're digging. Because I would hate if I was a mole and I was digging through the ground if I had a whole bunch of sand in my ears all the time, right? That wouldn't be very fun. So, like I said, they don't have any ears. But I have one more question for you guys. If you're ready. I want you to tell me, do you think marsupial moles have eyes? So go ahead and tell me in your chat box with either a yes or a no, do you think marsupial moles have eyes? And I'm gonna give you guys just a second to decide. I know it's kind of a hard question, it's kind of tricky. We'll see what you guys think. Do you think they have eyes, yes or no? Yep, a lot of us are getting it right. Some of us are saying yes, some of us are saying no. Yep, you guys are doing great. Okay, I'll give you just a couple more seconds and then we're gonna move on. All right. Okay. So great job, guys. Um, that was kind of a tricky question, right? So marsupial moles do have eyes. And if we go ahead and move on to the next picture, you can kind of see what those eyes look like. Um, they're not really what you would expect. They're really, really tiny. You can barely even see them. So if we look at the mole's head, we can see these teeny, teeny, tiny little red dots. And those are their eyes. So even though they have eyes, um, they're ha they have what are called vestigial eyes, which means that, yeah, they have eyes, but they actually don't use their eyes. So they are completely blind. Um, and we can see maybe how it would be really hard to see through those eyes because they are so tiny. And also they spend so much time underground that maybe they don't really need to see very often anyways, because they have such a great sense of smell and they have a lot of other adaptations that will also help them to get around underground without having to rely on their eyesight. So um, these guys are currently endangered, but they are protected under the Australian government and they have a really awesome recovery plan in place to help bring their populations back to a really good place, which is super cool. So, all right, I know we talked about a whole bunch of marsupials today. So if you guys are ready, um, I know you guys are bound to have a favorite because a lot of the ones we talked about today are super awesome and super cool. So I want to know, go ahead and tell me in your chat box what your favorite marsupial was that you saw today. Go ahead and tell me what your favorite marsupial was that we talked about today. I'm going to give you guys just a minute to go ahead and decide and to type. I know it might be a hard decision. Yep, I see some of us already starting to answer. You guys are so fast at typing. Great job. I see wombats. Wombats are really cool. Opossums, you guys already know that those are my favorite. Yep. 
Num bats or noon bats. They're really awesome, huh? I like the really stripy pattern on their back. It looks really cool. Marsupial moles. They're really weird, huh? They're pretty awesome. Kangaroos. Classic. Love it. Yep. All right, guys. Well, I'm glad you guys loved all the marsupials we looked at today. Um, I know that I have asked you guys a ton of questions today. So uh, for this next little bit, um, it's going to be your turn to ask me some questions. So before we do that, I just want to say thank you guys so, so much for learning with me today. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Brian and we'll see if we can start getting some of those questions answered. All right. Thank you so much. What amazing species are out there. So you can see how they're related, but they're so uniquely different. And um, sorry, I guess we saw that in the comments. Everybody talking about their, their different favorites. So uh, thanks so much, Ashlyn. Thanks for uh, to everyone at uh, Wonders of Wildlife for, uh, for helping to put this on. Thanks to all of you out there for, uh, for really great questions. Um, vocabulary, we knew we were going to get some, right? We knew what we were going to hear. I think we even talked about it right before. And a lot of people have been asking, where's the name marsupial come from? We also got some, hey, they, they tend to have fascinating names, um, you know, kangaroo, wallaby. But the, the most common question we got was, uh, how, how do they get the name Joey out of, uh, of baby marsupial? So let's maybe start there. And then if you have any other fun facts about the other naming conventions of who names marsupials and where do they come up with them? But Joey was the number one question. Yeah, that's a really great question. As far as the word Joey goes, I'm not entirely sure where that word comes from, but I do know where the word marsupial comes from. So uh, the word marsupial comes from the Latin name for pouch, which is marsupium. So if we're going to talk um, more scientific here, the actual word for a marsupial pouch is called a marsupium. So that is where the word marsupial comes from. As far as naming animals goes, this goes across the board for pretty much any animal species that we discover um, or that scientists find. Um, a lot of the times, if you are one of the people that discover that species, you actually get to name it, which is pretty cool. Um, some species, especially the um, marsupials that we talked about today from Australia, um, a lot of their names actually come from um, the indigenous people that live in Australia. They actually um, have names for those animals. And so some of their common names are names that a lot of other people call them will actually come from those names that the indigenous peoples have called them, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that is really cool. They're just like so unique you know you can kind of put you know you have sort of lots of names you go oh, okay that's a similar naming you know construction to that other type of animal and then you know the australian ones especially just have their own flavor to them which is uh, is really fascinating um another one came up a, a decent amount in, in different ways some, some folks were talking about hey is uh is the you know the the gray kangaroo the smaller one is, is that what we would consider a wallaby other people were asking just more specifically what's the difference between a kangaroo and a wallaby. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship there? We know they're they're similar. Is a wallaby a type of kangaroo? Are they totally se separate? And uh, and if so, what's the the major way to tell the difference? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, um, wallabies and kangaroos are very very um closely related. They're not quite the same, but wallabies are found kind of in the same group that we would find kangaroos in. Um, the main difference that tells us whether the animal we're looking at is a kangaroo or if it's a wallaby is actually going to be the size. So um, wallabies are actually really small. So they're actually about a third of the size of a red kangaroo. So they're pretty small. Um, another thing that kind of can clue us into whether we're looking at a wallaby or a kangaroo is by looking at their legs. So I know earlier I talked a little bit about how kangaroos have really, really powerful legs. Um, those legs that they have are really, really long. So if we're looking at the legs, um, we can tell by looking at a kangaroo that they have really long legs. If we're looking at a wallaby, their legs are going to be a little bit shorter. There are a couple other differences between kangaroos and wallabies that maybe um, we wouldn't be able to see um, just by looking at them um, from a distance. One of those things is that they have pretty different teeth. So wallabies are um, a little bit um, similar to the antelopine kangaroos we looked at earlier. They live in more forested areas. So in those areas, they're going to be um, eating a lot more leaves and things like that. Not so much grass like the other kangaroo species we looked at. And so their teeth are going to be a little bit flatter to allow them to chew up those leaves pretty well and grind them up before they swallow them. 
Um, kangaroos typically are going to have more um, slanted teeth that are able to chop through um, grasses because that is mostly what kangaroos are going to be eating. So there are a couple differences between kangaroos and wallabies. Um, some of them are kind of hard to see from the outside, um, especially if we're looking from a distance, but they are kind of different. Nice. Thank you. It's good Good that you, know, you have to spend a little bit of time in the weeds or in the vegetation that they to really understand the differences. I think we can all appreciate all of that. And you mentioned one of the major differences is in the legs, which leads me to one of my favorite questions is, you know, we see how powerful kangaroos specifically uh, their legs are, but their arms, they don't seem to use them much when jumping. What do they use their arms for? Do they have anything that we would kind of consider similar to hand, hands or are they more leg-like? What, uh, what How do kangaroos use their arms and, and what can you tell us about them? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. So kangaroos uh, typically don't use their arms for very much, but it definitely depends on um, what kangaroo we're talking about. So I do know sometimes um, they will use them when they're standing, when they're just kind of hanging out, maybe when they're eating, um, if they have to lean their body forward, because the front half of their body can be kind of heavy sometimes. So in order to support their body, they're going to have to use those front legs also to help support them. Um, but they also can use them for other things as well, specifically when we're talking about like male kangaroos, because they um, sometimes will, um, when they are, when it's, you know, time for them to mate, sometimes they will fight um, or kind of play around and they'll use those arms to kind of help them do that too. So there are a couple different uses for their arms, but as far as when they're jumping, they really don't use their arms at all. It's mostly going to be those really, really powerful back legs that help um, get them going. Thank you. Uh, wealth of information. Um, moving on to, let's come back to uh, to North America. I've got two North America questions from folks who want to see marsupials maybe in their own backyards or want to know if that's a good thing. Uh, one specific to uh, opossums and uh, and their babies. Do, do the babies ever fall out of sort of the pouch or, or like you mentioned, maybe more of just kind of like a layer of skin? You know, how, how protected are the opossum babies? And I guess a follow-up to that is what should we do if we see opossum babies somewhere? That's a really, really great question. So it is always possible for a baby marsupial to fall out of the pouch at some point. Um, that muscle that holds them in is pretty strong, but obviously if a baby wants to come out, they're going to come out. <laughs> or, you know, sometimes, you know, if the mom is running or something, sometimes the baby might come out, but it's pretty rare that that happens. Um, when we, if we do ever see a baby um, that is kind of by itself or away from mom, it's a really good idea most of the time to just leave the baby alone because there's always a really, really good possibility that mom actually knows where the baby's at. And we don't want to disturb um, those babies because if we do, then mom might be around the corner and she might be really upset at us. And we also want to make sure that we're staying safe. So in order to keep ourselves safe, it's really important that we make sure that we leave the wildlife alone if we can. We can always observe from a distance um, if we notice that, you know, maybe mom hasn't come back in a really long time. If you know of any um, like wildlife rehabbers in your area or anyone you know that you could call to maybe help you out with that situation, that's always a really, really good idea. But I would highly, highly recommend that whenever, you know, something like that happens that you definitely call a professional because they know how to handle those situations. And it's um, best that we try not to interfere because we don't want to get hurt, right? Because they're wild animals. They may not know that we're there to help them, but, um, you know, for them, it's just a little strange and we want to make sure that we stay safe. Awesome. Well, on that note, a lot of people have uh, a lot of time over the holidays uh, and we know that Wonders of Wildlife is a very safe place to learn about animals. So a uh, so couple of people asking, where is Wonders of Wildlife? Uh, what can I expect if I go to visit? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know where you are, what we could see and what's going on over the winter break for everybody? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So um, like I said earlier, Wonders of Wildlife is an aquarium and wildlife museum located in Springfield, Missouri. So we have a ton of amazing, amazing animals and exhibits here for you guys to see. So if you are able to come on over, I would highly recommend it. Come check us out. Um, we have a whole bunch of animals, like I said, everything from bears to stingrays to sharks. Um, we even have some marsupials of our own here. Um, you guys 
should definitely come check us out. We also have a, what we call our wildlife galleries or our wildlife museum, where we have a whole bunch of really, really cool dioramas from all across the world. So if you've ever wanted to know what it's like to step foot into the African savanna or into the Arctic, this is a really great opportunity for you to do that and kind of see what those animals would look like and maybe learn some new things about them. Excellent. Thank you. I uh, definitely have always wanted to set foot in both of those places. And uh, Missouri is a whole lot closer than those places themselves. So hopefully folks have an opportunity to uh, to get out and, and check out Wonders of Wildlife. If not on our way out, we'll put up a slide with uh, with ways to connect with Wonders of Wildlife and Varsity Tutors um, on social media and on, on websites. So you can plan your trip or figure out your next adventure. Ashlyn and the team are back here basically every month with uh, with more wildlife presentations. So, uh, so we'll see uh, hopefully lots of you back here uh, in January is as you can officially get going on your New Year's resolution to learn that many more things. And if you're getting a jump on it, uh, we want to invite everybody. We've got a great science is magic. You'll learn some magic tricks and the science that makes them work uh, here right about the same time uh, tomorrow as well. So uh, so thanks, Ashley and the team, for spending part of your winter break. I know you guys are really busy uh, during this break when everybody's got some free time and a lot of curiosity. Thanks to all of you for spending uh, part of your, it's that fun time during the holidays where you're not sure what day it is. I think it's Wednesday, spending part of your Wednesday with us. And uh, we hope to see everybody back here soon. So thanks, everybody.